Yo, what's going on? What's going on? We are live, active, back at it. The regular podcast. Another week, another episode, more topics, more good stuff. It's real. How y'all feeling, man? How y'all been this week? I'm looking up at the screen, but let me make sure I look at the camera here. How y'all been, man? I'm cool. I'm, I'm, I'm all right. You know, chilling, maxing, everything in between. You know, um, it's a lot of a lot of things I want to talk about, but I'm going to try to condense it down. Actually, there's there's not a lot of topics, but it's a lot of stuff that can be said because of stuff going on right now. Um, before I get into it, though, make sure you all subscribe to the channel, the regular podcast on YouTube. Make sure you Follow on Instagram, the regular network. My Twitter is a little bit, you know, a lot of people can't can't handle my Twitter. So I'm I'm really gonna stop sending people to the Twitter, man. I, I can't even tell you how many people got me blocked. I don't even know half the people that have me, or not even half, probably 90% of the people that have me blocked, I feel like I never interacted with them in my life. So I don't know. What the hell I'm blocked for on so many people's pages? I find out that I'm blocked because Shay will send me a link or something. I try to go to the page and I'm like, why can't I see? Like, who is this? What could I have possibly said to this person to make them block me? I have no idea. But I'm blocked by a lot of pre- random people. So I'm, I'm just done giving the Twitter out, man. People are just too offended by the stuff. I feel like I'm not saying anything crazy. I feel like I say a bunch of mellow, laid back just opinions, you know what I'm saying? Mostly facts, though, if you ask me. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, I, I got two things that I want to get into before I get into my topics, right? I feel like, is anybody else, like, get to the point where they so, they like something so much, like a snack, like, like food items? They like it so much that they just completely try to stay away from it because they know if they get it, how much they will eat, how much they'll consume of it. Like I'm, I'm one of them type of people, right? One of those things that I did, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because of how many I just ate, like in the last week or two, like oatmeal cream pies, bro. Oatmeal cream pies is one of them things for me. Like I grew up on little Debbie's, you know, you go, you you get you a dollar, you go to the store, you break it down. I get the 50 cent blue top pop. I'm getting the oatmeal cream pie. I'm getting a bag of Fritos, right? That was my dollar breakdown. Y'all let me know what y'all dollar breakdown was. People done done this on social media many years, but oatmeal cream pies is one of them things that you probably won't see me with them often. And it's not because I don't like them. It's because I like them too much. You feel what I'm saying? Like I, I, I can consume oatmeal cream pies like I, like people can consume chips. You understand? Like I could just keep eating them like back to back to back. I just like them now. I, I love oatmeal cream pie. Like it's, it's like a discipline thing to just say, I'm going to just, I'm going to eat them. I'll, I'll get at them. I'll get a box of them, whatever, maybe a couple times a year. But really I shouldn't do even do that. You know what I'm saying? I feel like that's discipline because I don't just eat them all the time. I'll try to stay away from them. You know what I'm saying? I'll go to the market grocer down at Forest Park, get the big dumb dumb boxes of them, and, and run through it. But I try not to do that too often. You feel me? I want to know, like, are y'all are y'all like that with something? Is there some things that you just like me? Also, another thing, I'm like, I guess that's my personality. Period. I guess I don't like a whole bunch of things, but if I like this shit. I'll excuse me if I like it, I'll probably love it. Macaroni and cheese is another one for me. Macaroni and cheese, like in, in recent years, I just kind of had and for these holidays where people cook macaroni and cheese and all that, like I had to just like fall back from it because of the amount. Like I'm one of the I get an obnoxious block out of the Big Mac. Like I get a, a stu like when I was younger, like a kid, like teens and all that. When it comes to leftovers and all that, the leftover days, when it comes to the what you're eating after Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that, my plate would just be macaroni, the whole plate, macaroni and cheese. Big ass block cut out of there. And I'm eating the whole thing. I'm just going to eat the plate of macaroni and cheese. That's how I was when it comes to macaroni and cheese. You feel me? 
So that's one that I really had to just, in, in recent years, I'm talking about the last five years, I'm just like, I got to s- stop. You feel me? I still eat it, but I just don't eat it. You know what I'm saying? I know my limits. Or not, I, don't, I don't have a limit, so I know myself, so I'm like, let me not even play with it like that. You know? I want to know if y'all like that or am I? I don't think I'm just tripping. I don't think so, but I'm sure there are other people like that. But I want to know, do y'all have that discipline where you say, I'm just not going to consume it because I know if I do, I'm going to go crazy with it. That's enough of that. But the, the biggest thing going on this week and what I've been following the most, it's probably not the biggest thing, but it's what I've been following the most heavy this week is week one of YSL trial. And people have been knowing it as a young thug trial, whatever you want to call it. The YSL Rico case is now being tried in the court of Fulton County in the state of Georgia. So it's a state Rico case, but Fulton County District Attorney's Office, Fonnie Willis, is who's chasing the case, right? So this has been the first week of it. This is about to be the longest trial in a very long time, probably the longest ever in Georgia. It'll be the longest, it'll be the most expensive trial in Georgia history, probably. I don't know. They don't put a number on it. Like, they don't give the public how much something costs, like a trial, and how much investigations, and how much the entirety of a whole case costs. But I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, confidently, this will be the most expensive trial that that the state of Georgia has ever seen. Maybe one of the most expensive state trials in the history of the United States. If they were to quantify how much resources and money they had to put behind this manpower, overtime hours, getting witnesses, jury selection, just just the amount of research is taken for them to try to piece together this weak ass case. Like I think it's gotta be, has to be one of the most expensive cases in history. Right. So we got week one. So first, pretty much they started out the week with opening statements, right? The state goes first in the opening statements. So it was the, the ADA assistant district district attorney. It's a black woman named uh, Attorney Love, they've been calling her. And um, she did her opening statement. That took almost the whole first day because there was so much pushback from the defense attorney, Brian Steele, uh, Young Thug's lawyer. He was objecting to so many things. And it got to the point where all the defense attorneys objected to a piece of the presentation that was being used by the district attorney, the assistant district attorney, the prosecutor, that they pretty much shut the court down for like four hours to sit in there without the jury to argue about this PowerPoint that the prosecutor had. Essentially, what happened was, if y'all remember a couple weeks ago, the judge started yelling at the prosecution team saying, why are y'all hiding evidence from the defense? Pretty much, the judge said, this is y'all final warning. Y'all better give the defense teams all of the evidence that you have. Do it now. That's a court order. If you don't do it, I'm going to throw everything out that you didn't turn over to them. Right? So then when they get when the trial started on Monday, what happened was the prosecution, and they were also ordered to give every every piece of media, every file, every document, every image, every video, whatever you plan on using in your opening statement, all of it, give it to the defense. Let them have a chance because clearly this is some type of discovery because you plan on saying it in the opening statement and then trying to prove it later on during the trial, right? So since you are doing it like that, give it to them so that they can have a chance to prepare for it, right? The prosecution, that was a court order from the judge. The prosecution did not end up doing that. They objected to what was going on in the court. Brian still said, hey, y'all told them to give us this. I've never seen this before. What is she doing? Why is she showing this to the jury? They, The judge sent the jury out and then they argued for four hours, pretty much saying they were pretty much editing this PowerPoint together, which was crazy. I've never seen nothing like this. They was up there editing this PowerPoint as a whole courtroom pretty much saying, hey, judge, this thing in this PowerPoint, this is wrong. This is the wrong person. This person that they said killed this person, he wasn't even involved with this case at all. How's his name right here? It was just all type of foolishness, right? So for whatever reason, though, 
the judge had said that it was court ordered last week to give over the documentation, right? The prosecution team didn't do it. But when the defense objected to it being used when the trial actually started during the opening statements, the judge allowed them to use it still. They didn't say, hey, you didn't turn this over, so throw it all out like he initially said. He said, if you don't turn it over, I'm going to throw it all out. He didn't do that. He kind of was lenient with them and let them just edit it on the fly. Uh, uh, literally, the prosecutor emailed a copy of this PowerPoint to the defense lawyers Monday while the trial was going on, and they all sat in there and edited this shit together. So I don't know what, what you know, the judge was heavy biased with the state on that one because he's supposed to throw that whole thing out. Then he got late on in the afternoon. It was about three o'clock. He was the judge was completely pissed off because the jury had been sitting there waiting all day, not in the courtroom. Judge is pissed off. Then he finally said, you know what? Nobody using PowerPoints. None of y'all because I'm pissed. Pretty much. He was like, none of y'all can use it. Defense and the state. Nobody. So then another one of the lawyers stood up and said, wait, why are we being punished when we did what we were supposed to do? I turned over all of my stuff to the state. I, everything that you as the court ordered for us to do, we did it on the defense. It's the state that didn't do it. So why are we being punished? Because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. That prolonged this shit even further. So it, that was just, this is just Monday. This is the opening statements. They couldn't even get through it. It took the entire day for the prosecutor to get through her opening statement. Right. And her opening statement, it was um, it was cool. It's, it, I mean, like, I don't know if I'm just. Hearing it from my bias perspective, I know I have my biases, but it don't sound like they don't have a case for real. They they are really reaching for for anything really. That's what it sounds like to me. So she she ran through everything, got through it. The next day, the defense attorney started to run through all of their opening statements. Some opening statements longer than others. None of the def defense opening statements were as long as the prosecutor. She was talking forever, probably because she has six defendants that she has to uh, prosecute. And they're just the, the defense. They're only doing one defendant each. So there's six defendants in this trial right here. So, you know, th so that's how th this thing starts out. This really this whole thing has been like a circus for real. That's to, to say the least. It's really been worse than a circus. It's crazy because they plan with people's f freedom right now. People who they wouldn't let get a bond, playing with their freedom, talking about they got 400 witnesses. The 400, wit the state is saying they have 400 witnesses, right? That list is the condensed list from the original 700 person list, witness list that they had originally. They condensed it down to 400 to kind of appease the court, but really, 400 is still an extremely high number of witnesses in a case where you claim to have evidence. If you have evidence, you don't need that many people to testify. So it's really this this right here is a landmark case right here. Right. First of all, depending on the turnout of this case, I think other states are going to follow suit and, and just take the blueprint from Georgia. First of all, even though it's not going to work the same in every state because every state has their own laws. Secondly, this freedom of speech stuff, because lyrics are being used in the court, this freedom of speech and music and rap specifically also. We get we're, we're going to get some new case law here. We're going to get some new precedent being set here. Right. So that's going to be tough for a lot of these rappers that, that rap about stuff that they probably actually was involved with. Right. And then just the fact of the implications on the rap industry as a whole, it's almost like. With a lot of the conversation being about how rap is dying, how the hip hop is falling off and all this good stuff, if. This coinciding with people saying rap is falling off and now they have a way they have they have an example now of how to get these rap crews out of here. If this is successful on the part of Georgia, if they are there, the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, if she is successful in dismantling YSL. She is laying the groundwork to get rid of some of the some of the most popular rap that a lot of us love all over the nation because rap 
is founded on expressing your raw emotions about your current condition, whatever that condition is. Just a lot of people that end up becoming famous rappers happen to come from poverty. So if you come from poverty, you start to talk about your current conditions and you talk about what you have been doing to get out of poverty. A lot of times that involves bending and twisting and breaking rules sometimes. So if she is successful in this, this does not only mean something as it relates to using lyrics in court. I don't even understand why that's such a big emphasis for people. That to me is a very small thing in the grand scheme of what could be going on right now. Right. To me, this is a worse precedent being set on people who may have committed crimes in the past, sometimes far past. Then they change their life. And now because a local authority doesn't like the fact that they changed their life and they didn't get them back then. Now they're going backwards and saying, let's go get them for old stuff that they're not doing anymore and that they're very far removed from doing. Right. A lot of the crimes that they're talking about in this whole Rico case are 10 years old. Plus a lot of them, I guess, uh, I think. No, I won't say that. But a lot of these crimes are old. So it's pretty much on some stuff like you made it out. You as a black man figured out a way. I, I don't need to be committing crimes no more. I figured out another way. And I'm setting an example for a lot of other dudes that might be committing crimes now that can do it another way. Now it's like, well, I can't even change my life now. So now I pretty much need to be squeaky clean from the from from birth now as a black man, because we, we were at a point where we were saying like, all right, just jump in the streets, get as much money as you can. If you go to jail, at least you had a good run. Right. That was that was a couple of decades ago. That was the mindset. Right. Get as much money as you can. If you go to jail, you can run the jails and you can still get your money. That used to be the mindset. And then we got to the point where, where people started setting, yo, this is the example of how you can get in this rap thing as a street dude. So Birdman comes in, Jay-Z comes in, and then a host of other like Southern trap rappers come in. They show street dudes how this is how you become a rapper. You ain't even got to be behind the scenes no more. You could become the straight up the artist if you got talent or if you got business sense. Then they showed that. So now it's like, all right, I'm going to do my hustle thing. Then I'm going to go transition into this music thing. And a lot of them older dudes, they never caught no cases like this. They didn't catch the case even close to this. Jay-Z's biggest case is what? Stabbing somebody in a club and it barely was a stab, you know, whatever. Well, that's his biggest like criminal case right there since he's been famous. They not letting the young dudes do that now. Essentially, they're saying you made it out and you did stop, but that that's not good enough. We need you for, we don't like that you stopped. We don't like that you made it out. We don't like that you have millions of dollars now. We need, we need payback for that. We need retribution. We need you to come back here and we're going to serve you up. So that's what I think is happening right now. So opening statements happen, right? That took two days. Then they called in their first expert witness. The state called in the expert witness. I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry because I'm, I'm going through this because if you've been seeing, I've been following this since they got arrested. Mostly because the Cleveland Ave, Cleveland Ave area is like close by where I'm at. It's not far at all. 15, 20 minutes, right? That, that's, that don't mean I got no inside information. It just means that it's local to me. So as somebody that's, following news stories and especially major criminal cases, I'm, I'm watching this one closely, right? And some of these people are like, Fonnie Willis was a politician where I currently live now before she became Fulton County DA. So that's, it's close, right? So they call their first expert witness and their expert witness is a police officer who's like a uh, detective, I believe. And he's a gang pretty much a gang expert. Essentially, that's what that's what he is. He's like a gang expert, how to identify gangs. He knows all the gangs in the area. He knows about gangs nationally. He knows how they move throughout the company, how they spread, how they, how, how they move throughout the country, how they spread, how they recruit. He knows the history of them, who's founded them, the different sets within larger gangs. He knows, all, he know, he's an expert, real expert. Like he was testifying and I'm like, all right. At first it was kind of, I was like, yo, who, 
how's he calling himself an expert? But then he kept going. I'm like, okay, he really is an expert. I don't know how. And I actually, um, I missed cross-examination of him. I, I, I'm assuming that that cross-examination from the defense didn't last long because the stuff he was saying, you want to get him off the stand as soon as possible because the information that he has, you don't want him explaining gangs to a, to a jury. He's going to make, he can make anything look like a gang because they're like, this nigga, this dude is a, is a real expert. You feel me? So he was even in there throwing up gang signs himself. Like that's how much he knew. He was, he was throwing them up. He knew, he explaining, this is what this means. This S, this Y, like he throwing them up in the courtroom and explaining what each part of the hand means to the jury. So that's not somebody that you even want on the stand. Get him get him off the stand as quick as possible. He was a great expert witness for the state. So they got done with that. That's about Tuesday afternoon, I think. What's today? Today is Wednesday. I'm I'm probably maybe maybe that was Tuesday or maybe that was I don't remember which day because the days are blurring together to me. So then I'll give you the parts that I see, right? So then they start to call other witnesses. <clears throat> Excuse me. The the next I guess significant witness that was puzzling the people was a white lady who is like a a club mom or what they call her a, a house mom or whatever at a club called the Gold Rush in Atlanta. Her, she lives in Noonan, Georgia. Her car got stolen and they brought her in for I don't know why. <clears throat> but the state brought her in as a witness to just say, my car got stolen. It was a young black man that was about 5'7", 130 pounds. He did it. He, they took my car. He hit me, rear-ended my car by my house in Noonan, Georgia. And then they tricked me and then he stole my car. Pretty much. That was her testimony. She didn't know nothing about the guy. She don't know his name. He didn't look like, I don't even get it, right? So then, <clears throat> she. it was 10, this happened in January 2013. So again, like I said, they're going to old crimes and like saying, you, nah, you niggas did this a long time ago. So hey, this is the thing about it, right? The person that they even assumed did it is not even part of this case. So I don't even get why the state called this lady. So then they get back and call the police officer who actually found who who came and found the car. Right. So the police officer found the vehicle at an apartment complex in um, around Hapeville or Hapeville Road or whatever. Right. I guess this is southeast Atlanta somewhere. So they found the vehicle. The person who. The cop seen get out of the car. He was, I guess they were still driving it. The person who the cop seen get out the car, also a person that's not related to this, that's not in this case, not related to this case, not a defendant, nothing. He's just out there. One of the actual defendants in the case was just there, out there, while the car was there. Right? They didn't catch him with the keys. They never seen him in it. Nothing with him related to this car at all. So again, I don't know why they called this lady. But I, it seems like, um, from what I'm what I'm gathering, the state can't bring up things unless they get a witness to say something. Then they can question it from there and go f- from there. That's what it's seeming like to me. I never realized that in criminal cases, but that's what is from what this judge has been saying to them, and what these objections that I've been hearing all day, and they've been objecting like I've never seen this many objections in my life, right? It doesn't seem like the state can just bring up something and ask about it. Like one of these witnesses has to say it first. So I guess they needed this white lady to say this so that they can talk about this car and then get this car and get this other cop who actually ran into one of the defendants while he was looking for this car. Right. So the dude, the cop is now on the stand telling about how he found the car. And he's like, yeah, I found it. Yeah. Nobody on this case was in that car. Yeah, I don't I don't know. But. One of the defendants, actually, he was there and I was un- I was an unmarked police officer. I'm undercover, plain clothes, unmarked car. They don't know it's a police officer. This y- this young man who is now this is the part that's like kind of went viral a little bit. Right. This young man who is um 
who was part of this case, he saw my car, walked up to my car, and he was very aggressive. They was trying to tell me to roll down a window, and I didn't want to roll the window down. And then next thing I know, he flashed a gun at me. He showed me his gun and pointed it at me or something like that. I was scared. I drove off. When I drove off, I called for back. I guess he had to drive off and couldn't arrest him because they're undercover. Also, his his uh, identity was concealed in the courtroom. They didn't show us who he was, what he looked like anyway. He said his name, but they didn't show his face. So I guess he wants to stay anonymous as an undercover officer, even though he said he's a captain now. Whatever. So he says the young boy pulls the gun on him and he drove off. And uh, he also said that when he was out there and the young man, he said he was aggressive and he was throwing gang signs at him. Right. Now, that was a key piece of that cop's testimony because he, he specifically said he threw some gang signs at me. Right. So then they're like, he goes on like, yeah. And then he I drove off and he went and threw his gun in the bushes and a bucket in the bushes somewhere. And we found the gun later on or whatever, whatever. Never found the keys to this car. So this, this stolen car is not related to this at all. So to have a, that lady come with the car stolen thing makes no sense at all. They found the car seven days later in a neighborhood in Southeast Atlanta. Right. So. She so then he, you know, they arrest the dude, all that. So then the cross examination comes. Like, right. So the defense lawyer comes up and questions him. He's like. And this dude. Um, he's like, yo, uh, so you said that this was a black attorney too. Whoever this black attorney is, is who should be speaking all the time. I can't, I don't, his name was attorney Adams. I think Brian still is just sit him to the side. Let, let the black ball, man, let, let Adams handle this thing. I don't know what's going on with still right now. Still is still is annoying the judge. Honestly, like hardcore annoying the judge like shit. So Adams comes up there. He's like, he questioned him doing this thing. Like he like, so you don't really remember uh, that much about it. Like they had, they had to rem- remind you what was going on, right? With the, with the police report. You didn't actually remember, right? He was like, no, I did kind of remember because this was like the last case I process, I, the last case I was investigating before I became like a lieutenant or whatever he said, right? So he's like, okay, so in your police report, you you uh. Or you, earlier you testified that he threw gang signs at you. He was like, yes, that's what I testified. He's like, in your police report, did you indicate that he threw gang signs at you? He was like, no. He Pretty much what happened is the cop just just out of nowhere, like he never has said this before, like any on any records anywhere, like when he did his police report, when he did any type of reporting, he never said that this boy threw any gang signs at him. And then the lawyer got him to say, that today in court was his first time ever saying that anywhere. Like he didn't even see, he, he went on, he got that man to say on record, he has never said that before that he that he saw him throwing gang signs. So then he questioned him like, so as a, as a police officer, and you weren't a rookie at this time, you were in it about seven years, you weren't a rookie. Um, so you didn't put that he threw gang signs in the police report it essentially he was trying to get to that would be significant in a in any type of criminal case if somebody is doing something criminal and then they throw gang signs that's significant no matter how you flip it no matter how you twist it pun intended is significant in a criminal case yet you didn't feel it was necessary to Throw get to to put this in a police report. All you put was that he was being aggressive, right? Then another defense lawyer came up and said, "Well, did you make an amendment to your police report later and indicate that he threw gang signs?" He was like, "No." So then the the prosecutor came back up and and did her whole thing of pretty much you didn't put every detail. Did you put what kind of hair he had? He was like, "No." Did you put what kind of clothes he was wearing? He said, "No." She like, "Why didn't you put what kind of clothes he was wearing?" So then the cop said, well, I didn't put that because he wasn't a fugitive. We caught him immediately. So there was no need to describe his clothing. She like, so it's safe to say that you didn't put every single detail of that day uh, about this arrest in your police report. He's like, yeah. And she's like, 
But does that make it any less factual that it happened? He was like, yeah. But to me, and I think a lot of people on social media that was watching, it was like, that's not really good enough to explain why you didn't put the gang thing in there. For pretty much, I guess, and and all crimes that you commit, the way that they're prosecuted and sentenced, if you're convicted, is enhanced if it involves gang activity or if it, yeah, if it involves gang activity, which is like an, an enhancer. So the fact that you were saying that this man committed what they called aggravated assault, aggravated assault was pretty much he pointed a gun at him. He committed aggravated assault and was throwing gang signs. That is 100 percent significant in a case like that. And you didn't even indicate it. And when he was going to fight that case of pointing a gun at you, he did. You didn't mention it then either. So I just thought that that to me. That was like, it made the prosecutor look bad. It made the prosecutor look like you brought a witness up here to lie for you. They even they even got him to say, did you, did the prosecution team prep you for this before you got here? He was like, yeah. Like, the fact that they prepped you and you still, it still went that way. That that looked, I think that was the biggest, uh, so far now, it's only a couple days. It's, it's only a couple days in now. So far, that was the biggest testimony that happened that had people shocked. But besides Brian Steele's opening statement, that was complete shit show. I don't know why he may try to make an acronym out of the word thugs and thugs stands for that. He tried to say push and peace stands for positivity as if he don't know that this man Gunner has a thousand interviews explaining what push and pee is. He never said positivity. Excuse me. So listen, man, this this. This case is a, is estimated to last six months, man. It's supposed to go for a long time. Like, this is only the beginning. I don't know what type. Like, for me, just looking at it, they re, they don't have, like, evidence to Young Thug really doing anything. The only thing they have for Thug is when it's time to start calling in those defendants that took plea deals. When it's time to start calling them in, that's when they're going to cook Young Thug. They're just going to get all of these people that took plea deals to say, Young Thug is the leader. He had us doing it. He did this and he did that. And he was calling all the shots and he was funding it. That's how they're going to get this. This is not a case outside of that. None of the stuff that none of the crimes that they've been bringing up further a gang at all. Mostly just this is Atlanta. Atlanta is like the Robin. This is what they do. They steal anything. Like you, you leave your flip flops outside. They might be gone. Like they'll take anything in Atlanta. So it's like, what, like, what's the racket here? Like, the, it's a RICO case. Now, what are you conspiring to further what racket? Because being in the gang alone, according to these people, is not a crime. Rapping these type of lyrics alone is not a crime. If you get into these one-off situations where you might, one person might shoot, the poli- shoot a cop trying to arrest them, this is a one-off thing. That doesn't further the gang. That doesn't do anything because that's a one-off, one-on-one interaction. Still in a, a millionaire having somebody go steal somebody's Buick, that don't make sense. That don't further no. That 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 doesn't make sense. What's the racket here in this whole conspiracy? That's what I'm not understanding, and that's not even why I'm how I'm understanding how they even got this thing to trial like this. These are and and what I just also found out today is a lot of the crimes that are part of this case here, these defendants were already found guilty of. The state can go back and charge you with this gang enhancement stuff, which is this gang Rico. They can go back and charge you with it. It's like a new crime. Pretty much you committed that crime that you were convicted of because you were trying to further the gang's activity. So these people are pretty much about to be punished again twice for the same thing, even though it doesn't fall under the double jeopardy protection pretty much because the new the, it's a new charge, the new charge of in furtherance of the gang. This is sick, man. I don't even know how long I've been talking about that, but it's a sick situation. And I'm giving it to y'all in my like fan of the sport of arguing these criminal cases. I'm just a fan of what they do. Like I'm a fan of how lawyers get up there, get get into it like that. So 
I'm not a legal expert, nothing like that. I'm just a fan of it. And um, it's funny that some people on social media say stuff like, yo, the lawyers, right? Like, you don't, you're not a lawyer, so you, why are you trying to say they right or wrong or whatever? But first of all, lawyers be wrong all the time. Second of all, the people that have these defendants' lives in their hands are just like me. Jury members, they're not lawyers. They don't have lawyers up there making decisions on if somebody is guilty or innocent. They have regular people. Some, they could be a lawyer, I guess, but they have normal people. Like they, the same type of people that y'all say uh, they don't know what they're talking about on Twitter and all this are the same people that they select from to become a jury and say whether somebody is guilty or not guilty. So I don't understand why they make it seem like we got to be a lawyer to have an opinion on a criminal case. That don't make no sense. Uh, but yeah, man, y'all look, I'm at the crib, so I'm comfy. These are pajama pants, man, pajama pants. Like I'm real comfy right now. Shout out to y'all for sticking with me last week as I, as I fought through the whole, the edible thing. I'm not, I'm not in that space now. So that's good. That's good. One, another one of the big stories that hit this week and it's been talked about to death. So I don't really need to get too deep into it. But I did want to touch on it was T.I. versus Sun King. And it's really like that the T.I. and Tiny versus King because Tiny was standing with T.I. Honestly. And essentially pretty much what it, it was joking on King playing with him like, hey, you're a silver spoon, baby. And King is like, no, I'm not. I guess King don't understand what silver spoon. That's the only explanation I could have. He don't know what silver spoon means, I'm guessing. For some reason, King is like publicly, I'm going to say publicly because I don't know what he's doing in his real life, but I'm gonna, in his uh, off the internet life, I'm going to say, but publicly, King is trying to paint, to, he, he's trying to figure out a way to identify himself with struggle. And it really don't make no sense. Like one specific uh, difference between King Major and Eris versus the other siblings that we all know about, Damani, uh, Neek Neek, Deja, Messiah. The difference between the, the King, Major, and Eris and the rest of them kids, King has two rich parents. So even so King never went to a space where it's like, oh, we don't have that much money. Both of King, like, so Messiah went when Messiah went home. After being at T.I.'s house, he went back to like regular, like, like real regular, not rich regular. He went back to regular life. When Damani went home to his mom's house, they went back to regular life. Like I was living on the South Side for four years. Uh, I would see them at the mall. I would see them at the movies like they was at a you was never going to be nowhere. Or not to say never, but you would see Messiah and Damani out doing stuff. Because they was with their regular, they was with their normal families when they left T.I.'s house. Like their mom's side of the family. Not to say normal family, but they were with their family that wasn't rich when they left T.I.'s house. King, like even when King is talking about going over his grandmother's house, his grandmother is the mother of Tiny. Tiny's been rich since the 90s. Or Tiny has, yeah, Tiny been rich since the 90s taking care of her mom. So what you going over a house that's also in a nicer part of... Clayton County and or maybe Clayton or Henry County, what they on the south side somewhere. Uh, but but it's not the trenches. It's not he like you want to go to the bando by Mamma house? Like the, the, the that he is proven to everybody that he don't even know what like what 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 he what's going on when he think that anything in that neighborhood where his grandmother lives is a is a is an actual what you would call a bando. Like that's that's he just telling on himself and he don't even realize he telling by saying shit like that. He like, y'all know, I, he telling his parents, y'all know I stand on business. What does that mean for you? I know a lot of people said this already, but you telling people you stand on business and it's because you're going to take them to a, to a house that probably was foreclosed on in your grandmother's neighborhood. That's what you call an bando. Like it ain't it ain't a trap house. It's just a house that y'all could sneak in the window of and probably you and your little friends probably smoke smoke weed in the house. That's what you call an abandon. Like ain't no money being made out of there. Ain't nothing going on and ain't no fiends in there. Ain't no crap. Ain't nothing going on in there. It's just an empty house because somebody for, got foreclosed on and got kicked out. That's what happened. 
It ain't no type of band. You can't. I feel like look. For some of y'all younger people, I'm at the point where I'm kind of I'm old school now. You can't just call anything anything. A bando is derived from abandoned house, but it ain't just an abandoned house. There's more to it to be calling it a bando. It's more to it. All right. So that boy don't even know what he's talking about when he say he stand on business. He's like, y'all want to go? He's telling his parents. Y'all, T.I. is create the inventor of trap music. He telling him, do you want to go see a bando in a 400,000 plus neighborhood? Dollar house neighborhood. Like, come on, man. Stop. But that's whatever because, you know, T.I. also just went viral. Like, so he went viral for yoking his son up for, for talking crazy like that at the Falcons game. The boy didn't got no cooth. Went crazy. They went viral for that. So then now he just goes viral today because somebody played. So T.I. and his son did get into it. And T.I. did yoke his son up, but that's still his son. He still love his son. His son still love him. They going to do that with each other, but they're not going to let nobody else do it to them either. Right? So in Atlanta right now, some club promoter thought it would be a funny idea to, to make a club, like a promoter, like make a club flyer and put T.I. and his son on there, but like in a joking way, like he was playing with them. And what I think, what I was told in the streets, what I've been told, what I heard is that the flyer had like that image the, you know, the Homer Simpson and Bart thing where Homer's choking Bart. It, it, they did like a rendition of it where it's T.I. choking King. And I guess they put that on the flyer. And in some type of way, it got the T.I. So then T.I. shows up to this club and spazzes out on everybody. I'm about to play it, actually. Let me play it. Let me play it because I like T.I. went off. He went off. Here you go. That's like for what King probably don't understand. What what King probably don't understand is that's where you standing on business. You ain't standing on business because somebody said you was a silver spoon. When you actually do have two mega millionaire ass parents, you actually there's no reason to stand on business on that because it's true. Somebody playing with your kids and you and your image and all that, that's when you need to be standing on business. T, now, y'all, uh, I'm going to put the video in here. T.I. is yelling at a bunch, it's all grown men around this. He's yelling at grown men, all grown men. Ain't no kids around, ain't no women. You can hear like women in the background, but he ain't, that ain't who he's talking to. This is all men. He looking them face to face, barking on them. You feel me? 
People bigger than him. Mostly everybody in this video was bigger than T.I. Pretty much. He's barking on him, though, because he's telling him, no, we're not going for that. Y'all playing with me. You playing with my son. Y'all won't make a dollar out of this club again until I get paid. Flat out. And that's what he told him. No money, no beer, no partying, no nothing is going to happen at this club until y'all, pretty much until y'all pay me for putting me on this flyer. It's an extended video, like a longer one where it shows actually, T.I. said, y'all niggas better not turn the music on up here until I get my money. And he was serious and they didn't turn it on. It's a video showing T.I. walking out of the club saying, all right, go ahead, turn the music on now. And he walked out with him, him and his people. They walked out. So that's that's a lot of people saying he petty for that. They like, yo, that's like, come on, like, it's a flyer. Like, why you doing this? That's petty. Like, you rich. Why you tripping about $10,000 or whatever? You know, T.I. probably getting more than $10,000. But he like, uh, they, they pretty much, some people on his side, some people not. But I'm on his side because, first of all, we talking about a, a, a mega successful artist right here, T.I., right? From two, like from the from trap music album until Paper Trail, his run is his run is disgusting. Hits after hits after this is a mega successful artist. Reality shows, real estate. Restaurants, the trap music, trap music museum, like this nigga is super successful. So the fee for him to come somewhere is probably high. You know, it's probably not chump change for nobody. It probably costs a lot of money to get T.I. somewhere. So to put T.I. on a flyer to sell something where he ain't agreed to it is probably why he's saying. And on top of that, he said. Uh, I'm never going to let nobody manipulate you. He said something like, you ain't going to let nobody manipulate the image of your child. So they was playing with his son with that too. So it's like, not only is y'all trying to use me to sell something, y'all disrespecting my family while y'all doing it. Y'all just think everything is just a game. So he pretty much said like, just because I, I do the expeditious leads and the supercalifragilistics, it don't mean this ain't still my city. And it don't mean that we can't still come to any establishment and shut it down. He that's exactly what he did. He shut it like he literally told him, don't y'all he said ain't gonna be no party in here today, the next day that I'm gonna come back every day. Y'all ain't gonna party here no more. And if I don't get paid. That's what he told him. And somebody escorted him to the back room, the office or whatever. I don't know if they gave him cash or check or what. Maybe he's wired, Zell, direct I don't know what they did. But he walked out and it was silent in there. It wasn't no music playing because he told him until I tell y'all to put that music back on, y'all better not touch the DJ. The DJ better not do nothing. And when he walked out, he said, all right, go ahead. Y'all go ahead and party now. You don't often see that type of thing, but hey, it happened, man. T.I. still T.I. You know, it's, it's, I mean, you know, when you move to like I'm a I'm a transplant, what they call it. Like I'm a, I'm new to it. I'm not I've been here about nine years, but when you move to Atlanta, you start to realize that you start to realize who is who and what rappers image and reputation match up with what we seen them doing on their music and all that type of stuff. There's a there's a few. And Gucci and TI is, is them. Gucci, East Side. T.I., West Side, 2 Chains, South Side. The name and image match. These places, it, it, it match. Like what, what, what they rapping about and what the stories that you hear around the city and the, pe the people they're affiliated with, all this type of shit. Like it future, it all match. You, Young Thug, as y'all see this Rico case, it all match. I like Lil Baby. It all match. Now, I will say one person who you wouldn't expect it to be like that with would be Playboy Cardi. That's not to say he was like no type of boss in the city, but whatever he got going on now, his people don't play with him. Like, 
listen, you know, you learn quickly who's what and what's where and you know what I'm saying? It's best if you, if you like me, when you came down here to just work and you ain't want to get in, in, in nobody way, you want to stay out of the way, the best bet is to do that. Don't mix your, your world with a world that you ain't ready for. You know what I'm saying? And with me, more so, it's just I'm on family time. I'm not on, I'm not in the mix. I'm not even, I'm not in nobody way anyway. Even when I come on here on my podcast to talk about these people, I'm never, I'm never even disrespectful at all. You feel what I'm saying? I if I felt like I needed to disrespect somebody, I would be prepared for whatever come with it. But I'm just saying that you, if you not gonna do what they gonna do. If you're not willing to be on what they own, just stop. I just, there's no reason to even play like that with these people. And this club promoter found that out. You like it, Atlanta is Metro Atlanta is huge, but if you have a problem with somebody, it could shrink like tiny. It could shrink tiny. It can, pun intended. It could get tiny in this city. Like it could, it, you know, we talking about like Atlanta stretch. You go. Conyers, Covington, all the way to Winston, damn near Alabama, all the way up to damn near Athens, Georgia, all the way down to like McDonough, right? That's a large area for Metro Atlanta. Like this is huge. But if you have a problem with somebody and it's, they get to making phone calls to find out who you are and where you at, they're going to get to you. So y'all be cool. Atlanta, Southern Hospitality, all of that. But this, they got an underworld that's strong, too. And it's, it's police is involved, politicians involved, judges, lawyers, doctors, all t- like shit strength. And you you have a problem with some of these, especially the ones who've been here for a long time. You know what I'm saying? It's like some of these people not from there, but they've been here for a long time. But the people that's from here, forget about it. Like you think you... Forget about it. Hey, look, so another thing that happened today that was major, especially in um, battle rap, Sue Surf got sentenced today. So for, for pretty much he, Sue Surf had caught a Rico case pretty much, right? I think the end of last year or yeah, the end of last year, maybe early this year, something like that. Sue Surf, if you don't know, is a battle rapper, major battle rapper out of New, out of New Jersey, Right. He caught a Rico case because um, his affiliation and his membership in the Rolling 60 Crips out of New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey, right? So, again, this is a case of, you know, people who come from the streets and they trying to change their life and they try to get out of that world and go do something else. It's like, nah, but you was part of this thing back then, so we can't let you go. So... He, he took a plea deal. He said, you know what? I'm going to just plead guilty to it. Like, maybe the judge would be more lenient on me because he was facing 30 years. So it's like, I, you know, he got a kid. He got a kid. He got one child, I think. And he got a lot to lose. So he was just like, you know what? I'm not going to try to fight this. I'm going to just go ahead and uh, and plead guilty to it. And then, because, you know, it's, sometimes your a plea deal does not include the time. You know what I'm saying? I know about that too well, right? Sometimes the plea deal is just you plead guilty and we're going to ask the courts to be lenient with you. But it's really not a guarantee. You still can get a whole bunch of time. It's just up to the judge when you get to that point, right? So they uh, he pled guilty. Then today they went into the courtroom. He had a bunch of character uh, state character witnesses there for him to say, like, this is a good guy, community member, all this good stuff. You know, a lot of the battle rap community some of the higher up people was there to support him. I seen Tay Rock. I seen Nunu Nails. I seen Beasley. And they said Beasley actually spoke for him. Sh- uh, Shotgun Shug was there. Uh, some of his Raw, bu- raw Bunch family. I think Qua showed up, his manager. It just was, you know, it was a good showing for him and all that good stuff. So the judge sentenced him to five years, which if you're facing 30 and you can get that thing knocked down, to something like five, just because you play guilty, it's like, it's kind of hard to not do it. You feel me? And, you know, that's almost like, 
it's kind of best case scenario because as of course we know as black men, you get penalized for defending yourself. So, and, th- and your lawyer will tell you, yo, if you take this to trial, they're going to give you more time, which I don't even know why that's not illegal. Right. Why is that not illegal? How come everybody knows it exists, but they still do it? Right. It's sick. It's really a sick system. And they, they attack us specifically with that because you never hear about like somebody like um, Derek Chauvin can take his case to trial and they're not like, oh, well, let's max him out. Let's get let's 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 get this nigga 150 years because he took it to trial. Like, no, he still got a regular sentence for killing somebody. You feel me? And he got he didn't get life. I don't I don't remember what he got, 20 years or something like that, but he killed somebody though. You see what I'm saying? Brutal kill too, because you you know you did like they suffered through that death. So they don't do that to nobody else but us. Everybody else is allowed to get a lawyer and actually defend themselves. Black people got to get a lawyer to go to pretrial. Like they want us to just get a lawyer and stop this shit at the Stop it at at this preliminary hearing. You know what I'm saying? Like, stop it, preliminary hearing. Let's get you a deal. Take the deal. If you don't take the deal, we're going to smoke you. Like, that's the type of stuff they do to black people. And we all know it's existing. We all all know what's happening. But there's nothing we could do to stop it because the people who can help out with this they really don't care because they're looking at it like, well, you're a criminal anyway, so we don't really care about you and your rights. We don't care if they're doing something unethical with you. Who cares? You're a criminal. I think it's sick. But shout out to Shoe Surf, man. You know, it's no no need now to say free him. Now it's just a matter of just, you know, for the people who want to keep track and just count them down. You know, five years, they already saying he got a year um, time served, essentially. So that's four left, and then you're going to do a percentage of that. So I know I seen Quas say he'll probably do about three and a half left, uh, three and a half more years, and then he'd be out of there. So what I'm what I'm hoping is that, you know, all of the all of the dudes that's starting to get caught up in all this type of stuff, these type of Rico cases and all this, if you get a chance to get out of it, it's by either you get a, a low sentence or if you get if you actually beat it or something like that, you really gotta be focused on making sure that you and the people around you understand that your freedom is number one for you that that has to be number one it got to be it has to be above money it got to be above your kids it got to be above your wife it got to be above everything see some people think that they get out of jail they get out of prison or whatever and they got to put everything else before themselves because they like they try to make up for, for lost time and shit like that you cannot do that when it comes to being a felon and how you got to move as a felon, you got to put yourself first. Putting yourself first is not a bad thing. See, it's, it's nothing wrong with being selfish because guess what? The people that you go crazy trying to take care of and all this type of shit, they not thinking about your freedom. They they probably want you to be free, but they're not thinking about your freedom. They want you to do anything to help take care of them. They don't really care what you do. Even if you got to go back, they like, it's, hey, you he went back to jail trying to take care of me. That shit ain't cool. If you if you got to be poor to be free, I'd rather you be free and poor than be in prison from having a sick. Because this is the thing about it. If you go say you about to you about to hustle for another. For, you, so you're going to start hustling, doing whatever again to get money illegal or whatever. Right. Your run ain't going to be that. It's going to be even shorter this time because now you're on probation. So police contact at all is a violation. If they catch you with something. If they catch you doing something, they you got a new case and you got probation violation for that, right? So you can get you get time for your new trial, your new charges, and they're gonna smoke you on a probation tip, right? Or parole, however you got out. It's not worth it. Recidivism is really something that that people gotta really understand more. And not for the people who ain't never in trouble, who never did nothing, it's for the people who are in these type of situations and they feel like they want to get out, hit the ground running, start taking care of people, stuff like that. You cannot do that. You can't do that, man. I'm telling people this from, I know when you get out of jail or prison, it got to be you and your freedom. Number one, I don't care who in your life. I don't give a, I don't care who you think you owe something to. You have to be number one. 
And the number one goal need to be figuring out another way to live your life so that you don't end up back in there. That's it. I know that this is, this is a hot take. I don't know what it is, but your, your freedom is above your kids. I don't care what's going on. Your kids will thank you more for being around than they, than they like, you see how King is acting? His dad is, is millionaire up, but he wasn't around. Zanique also said the same thing about her mom. Her mom had plenty of money, but she wasn't around like that. If you can find a balance to be like, I can get money and I can still be, get, be around, that's the best case scenario. If you're doing something that's going to take you away, you increase the chances that your child is going to end up eventually being a delinquent themselves because they're they missing out on that guidance that you have. So you're going to go back to jail trying to take care of somebody and you're still going to be gone anyway. That don't even make sense. So you can't take care of them anyway. So listen, you ain't going to hear too many people say this. I'm going to say it. When you... When you get into that land of catching felonies and shit like that and you want to change your life, if you really serious about staying free, you got to put yourself and, and, and your freedom before your family. It's that serious. The police can't wait to lock you up. Nick, my, my G, if you thinking about this, a lot of Impoverished communities, black, impoverished, urban or suburban communities have a lot of people that have felonies in them, right? Some of y'all don't even realize this. People with felonies know this. It's a it's a probation violation for a felon to be around other felons. So literally you just being in the neighborhood you live in because you can't afford to live nowhere else. You being around people can get you violated and sent back to prison. That's the that's. The viol- that's the crime itself. You was around niggas with felonies. That's how bad they want to lock you back up. Literally, the environment you live in is full of people like you. And you being there is a crime in itself. It's not even a crime on the books. Just some shit they made up for people on probation when they got a bunch of black people on probation for no reason. So you paid your debt to society, you went to jail, now you came home and they got you on this thing where they could just violate you for anything. Being around people that are similar to you can get you put back in prison. Think about how sick, that's how bad they want to lock you back up. That's why I say your freedom is above everything. Your family, your money, your free, look, because some people might not understand the whole freedom above your family thing. This is how serious it is. Your freedom is above your money. Your freedom is more important than having money. Some people just don't understand that. That's the thing about it. Like you are of no use to your family. You ain't of no use to your community. You ain't of no use to your kids in prison. All of it. Like, look, this is what we do. We go to prison. You reading some books. You starting to learn. Oh, I'm getting into the Bible. I'm getting into the Quran. I'm getting into this book, this book. Now I got a bunch of wisdom that I can say over the phone, bro. The person in your neighborhood with with the influence and with the cool stuff and with the cool clothes, they got more influence than you with your books in prison over your kids. Your kids are going to hear you when you go and you give them that good. Hey, the crocodile in the bush is always more dangerous than a lion in a tree. All that type of shit right there. Right. Your kid is going to hear you. With your, with your parables and all your, your that type of shit, right? But they're going to be listening to the people on the streets. They're going to hear you, but they're going to really be listening and paying attention to what the per- person on the street telling them, which is who knows what they're telling. You never know what they're telling them. You ain't there to, to, to figure it out either. You're going to hear about it when somebody calls you on the phone to tell you or when you call somebody on the phone and they tell you. You cannot pair from behind bars. It's not even tell, it's like, like, stop. I'm telling you, man, and I'm, I'm, I'm going on this rant because that's how serious I need my people to understand this, man. Your freedom is more important than your kids, your wife, your if you're a woman, your husband, or if you're a man, your husband, your kids, your spouse, your family, your money, everything. Your freedom is the top priority if you are somebody escaping the street life. Period.
for my people that have escaped and, and, and I'll say for the people that have made it this far and ain't seen no significant jail time and you still think like it's sweet to just play out like stop playing with the streets man get out while you still can because when they get you they're going they're going to stay on you too for the rest of your life you made it this far without getting caught up in nothing good for you leave it alone man Dang, I'm trying to think, should I discuss this last piece? You know what? I'm going to say it, man, because this is something that I normally would. This is about to be midnight, but I'm going to just go ahead, man. Let me go with the flow. I don't even know how long I've been on here, but I'm going to just go with it. Let me get a cup. Let me get a swig, man. I look kind of fat sitting on this couch. This is crazy. Hold up. I ain't, look, I ain't fat, y'all. I ain't fat. I'm just, my hoodie. My hoodie had me looking a little, little fat sitting on the couch, but I'm good, y'all. I'm straight. But no, look, I want to talk about this um, real quick, this no jumper versus fake immunity world thing, right? Because it's so interesting to me. And I, I normally don't talk about like what I'm like the other podcasts and stuff that I'm entertained by mostly. But the biggest thing that I've been into right now has been fake immunity world back on fig community. Truth in the uh, uh, let the record reflect with the Apollo like, this is, shame on you. This is what I've been on. This is the world that I've been, like, consuming lately. It's just good entertainment. It's funny. Like, these is all funny people to me. Very, very funny. It's like comedy. None of these people are comedians, but do know, but it's very funny to me. Like, this, all these shows is hilarious to me, right? But one of the biggest stories going on right now on the West Coast and the media is No Jumper versus Fig Community World, right? And the reason is because if you don't know what's going on with this, the people at Fig Community World, which would be AD, T Rail, Duno, Pun, were working with No Jumper last year, right? Or earlier this year, right? They was working with No Jumper. AD, T Rail, and Duno was actually on a show. They had a show called At the End of the Day. Uh, some things happened. Adam did something to AD that AD didn't like. So they all broke off, left, started their own company called Fig Unity World, FMW, right? And that is AD, T-Rail, Pun, Duno, and Smack. That's Fig Unity World, like the head people. And then they got a bunch of people that they work with. Now that's considered an umbrella where you got a bunch of stuff going on, right? Like a conglomerate. This is like a, this is really like a, a media conglomerate being built right now right they have a collection of shows under what they call the umbrella so fig community world the the actual page on youtube has shame on you which is like the anchor podcast that they do every wednesday then they have a show called we starving then they got a sports show called uh, we starving is a food show where they go to restaurants test out the food then they have Numbers on the board, like their new sports show that they're testing out right now. And they do the news. They do Fig Community World News two days a week, right? So they got some good content coming out. But then they also have shows on their own platforms, but they also consider that to be under the umbrella. So you got Back on Fig, right? Back on Fig is T-Rail, Smack, and Heather, and MacWap too sometimes, most times, right? Then you have Community, which is AD, Pun, Ace Boy, Trey, Illa, Illa and Hove on Thursdays. Then you have Ace Boys Worldwide, which is Pun, Ace Boy Pun, Ace Boy Trey, Ace Boy Manny, Ace Boy Rios, and then Illa. A lot of times they have Ladies Night, which is Illa, Barbie, Auntie, and Worm sometimes. They have Let Me Cook, which is like making the biggest splashes right now. Then you also have like a satellite show, which is kind of under the umbrella, but it's not really, but it's kind of Apollo with MacWap, Keem, Tiny, and TF, right? So am I missing anything? Um, then you got Keem with Truth in the Details. Like it's all, and you have, uh, which is not really on, on the umbrella, but it's, um, what's the show called? With uh, The Congregation with Tiny and, and Drebo. But anyway, so I'm I'm fully, I don't watch all these shows, but I'm fully like aware of what's going on, right? I watch a lot of it. I'm not, I don't watch everything, but I'm, I'm, I'm aware, right? So essentially 
when the FMW dudes that was on at the end of the day, T Rail, A D, Duno, when they left No Jumper, it was pretty much like a, a soft beef, like kind of a beef, but it was like a cold war at war at first. They was like throwing little shots at each other, little subliminal stuff. There was some F no jumper stuff at the shows back in um, March or May, whenever that was. I think it was May. They were saying T Rail went out just out of nowhere, just like F no jumper. So then things got a little bit tense for a little bit. Then the FMW dudes back T Rail and them, they they stopped saying anything, and then Adam started just going in on them, right? Started going in on them a lot, bombing on them, just saying whatever, saying all type of stuff. And then you come recently, they beefing and all that. People who who care about this, or they know what's going on. So essentially. It came to a head this week where some where Ace Boy Pun and the crew that he was with this day, Ace Boy Pun, Trey Hove, Mark Nasty, all it like they ran into somebody that was up at no jumper while Adam was talking crazy. And they approached him. And this guy is actually a major clothing designer out of Atlanta, out of LA, right? Name is Desto Dub. Awful lot of cough syrup. If y'all seen rappers wearing this stuff, like his stuff is big. He doing he doing his thing out there in LA, right? And actually, he about to put this puffer coat out. I want that joint. I gotta see how much it costs, though. I ain't just about to blow every blow a bag on a, on a, if it's a crazy price. But I like the way it looked, though. But so they run into Desto Dub. Pretty much, it run into they pressed him. He got scared. Pretty much, like he was shook. He was out. He was pretty much out of there. He didn't want to talk. He was backpedaling, like pleading for his pleading, copping please, all that. He like, yo, I ain't got nothing to do with that. Like, I'm a businessman. I don't, I don't, I'm not in that. Like, leave me out of it. So pressed them. Some fan recorded it. So we all got to see it. It looked kind of bad, right? So then after that, Adam pretty much went, did a whole live show with uh WAC 100 where he waved the white flag. He said, I don't want nothing else to do with this. I want to stop it. I don't want to, I don't want to go where this is about to go. I'm hearing stories about where this can go with these organizations, which he pretty mean gangs, where this can go out here. And I don't want it to go there. And I know that I'm going to just take responsibility because I'm going to be blamed for it wherever it goes. So I don't even want like, please stop. I'm waving a white flag. Adam said F that. But I do want people to understand like every, so people who care about this already know that I just, what I wanted to really talk about was who is Fig Unity World? Like, who are these people? And I want people to understand that the reason that they that what they're doing to me is so significant because these guys who ended up getting into podcasting and doing streaming and all this type of media stuff, this is a rare occurrence for what's going on. Like they keep on calling this stuff like the West Coast version of this, but I think they are not giving themselves enough credit. These dudes are the first of their kind pretty much anywhere in the country. They are starting a media conglomerate of all people who are former muscle in the music industry. That's that's who they are. Like if if you don't realize who they are, this is just a whole group of just that. Like when you when they like, oh y'all better check in when y'all come to L.A. These are the people that people check in with. They they but they don't talk like that on their podcast. They joke. They have fun stuff like that. They talk about girls and fashion and money and not money but you know fashion and business and just they hot topics, all that. They don't talk. They don't like tell old war stories. So a lot of people, I don't think realize who they are. And I don't think Adam realized who they was because he just see them joking all the time. And he just think like, Oh, I can play with them because they play all the time. So I'm going to play with them. He not realize These are the people that when people come to LA and they need favors and they need somebody to come with them and protect them and all that. These are the people that they call. Like when, when we hear when you hear about stuff happening in the streets and somebody got robbed and somebody didn't had to get their chain back, these I'm not even being like figurative. These are literally the people getting people's chains back. These are literally the people helping people defend themselves when they come to LA or making sure that they're safe, making sure that gangs don't beat them up and all that. That's literally who these people are. The muscle for so if you it, like A D and his homies is like the muscle around and behind OT Genesis, right? T Rail and his homies was like the muscle behind Tiger for 10 years, right? And who supposedly who 
Well, yeah. So the muscle behind Tiger, right? Made it so that Tiger could move around all this time. Like Ace Boy Pun, they have been the muscle for like producers and other people like that. Like like they done beat up people all over the industry because of making sure that that stuff was being regulated out there, right? Hove is AD's big homie. TF, Tiny, these is like the, these people. Mac Wap and his and his people were not to say that he's the muscle for Kendrick Lamar, but he's one of his background. He's a DJ now, but his background is Compton Street behind Kendrick Lamar, right? The, this is a whole collection of people who are the people that get called when the rappers say, hey, I got a problem. I need help. This whole fig community world from like top to bottom is all them niggas. Just a bunch of muscle. That's all they is. Not that's not all they is. They business people. But I'm saying that that's pretty much all of them got the background in that. So when Adam is playing with them, he's thinking like he's gonna play with them the way academics plays with rappers. Right? That's what he's thinking. Cause he's not really, even though he's been in LA for a decade and all this, like he's still not really understanding who he had in his building with him. And they looking at Adam like. How how you playing with it? Like he looking at Adam, they looking at Adam like I can't even believe you playing with us like that. We was playing, but you trying to take it somewhere else. He calling T Rail's wife a prostitute. He telling Pun you a baked potato. You not really like that. Come to my store. My man's got the Smith and Wesson. He talking crazy to these people, and they like they was playing at first, and now they like yo, you really threatening us. You really telling us that see you in the streets and you gonna have your security do X Y Z like he so he so they took it somewhere else because like I said these aren't because their background is in that type of activity they're trying to they don't want that reputation no more they want the reputation of we're legit media people now we don't want the, we don't even we a lot of them talk about it like it's embarrassing some of the stories that they have they don't even want to talk about them because they like yo why was I doing that. Like they feeling like, damn, I done, we done pressed and beat up people. Like these people done been into it with Ice Cube. And it's like, they, they looking at it like, yo, this is like embarrassing stories now looking back at what they used to be doing to people. That's who this man found himself in a beef with. And he realized quickly that I have to wave the white flag. This whole crew is represented by like some of the, some, some of the most respected gangs in the West, in, in the in the West Coast. You talking about Five Dudes Hoovers, Five One Troubles, Compton Crips, Southside Crips, Southside Crips in the um Lantana block. You talking about Compton Pie Rules. You talking about like there's a this is I'm just talking about all in that crew that's who these people are there's one insane crips just big melting pot of that so you could imagine that adam found out quickly after that desto dub thing oh these people are not safe to play with I don't want this to go anywhere. They know where I live. They know what my wife looks like. They know what my kids look like. They know where my businesses are. I don't want to do this no more. I'm out. Wave the wife. I'm done with this one. Nope. And I think that's best. And I also want to say. Shout out to punning them. For not doing nothing to that black man. Over stuff that white man was saying. Even though, yeah, Desto Dub probably was laughing at some of the jokes and saying little stuff, but he didn't he didn't do nothing bad enough to where he got to inherit Adam's beef like that. So y'all did press him. That's cool. Like y'all didn't cross no lines, I don't think. But I'm glad y'all didn't do nothing to him. I hope y'all don't do nothing to Brick Baby because I don't like Brick Baby is really just standing his ground. I don't think he really is saying like he want to see y'all. He want to he not really praying to see y'all. He was saying, I pray somebody play with me like that, meaning not y'all, but just in general. I pr- like I don't think that I, I hope they don't run into each other. Brick Baby is representing the 60s and all that. Like, I don't think that to me, that would be whack. 
that would make it all the way whack. Then it's like, y'all y'all might as well go back and work for Adam 22. If y'all going to start fighting black men over something Adam said, y'all might as well go back to No Jumper and be with them. Because y'all representing what he represents now. You're going to tear down black people because of something white people said. Like, you, you might as well go. So so as long as y'all, like, keep it like, like, you know what I'm saying? Don't violate no black people because of him. Now, if, if, it, if he do something bad enough to where y'all feel like y'all got to get him, that's different. But, like, come on. Y'all beef is with that white man. Stick to the white man. Stay on him. That's the, I mean, I can't tell y'all what to do. You do what you want. But I'm just saying, though, like, you know, stay on that man. Run him out of L.A. You understand? Because I feel like if he was black, he would have been dead by now talking the way he was talking. So he, he even though he waved a white flag, I don't think the pressure need to stop. Honestly, niggas be like, "Oh, I don't want to do." He gonna call the he gonna call the police on me. I ain't gonna know. He gonna put me in jail. How come nobody ever be worried about going to jail when it come to hurting a black man though? Because you gonna go to jail for killing a black person too. But I don't be stopping nobody. They still go do it. Like I'm just do the time. Well, do that to white people too. Then, come on, man. Not just any white person, but ones that's violating, telling you got the Smith and Wesson for you and all that. That's a threat. That's no dub ain't threatening nobody. And y'all, it, it would took 48 hours to see him. So, yeah, man, get get at that man, y'all. I'm about to get up out of here. I feel like I went way for a long time. I was talking about a few topics for a very long time, man. Uh, I appreciate y'all for checking me out. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, the regular podcast on YouTube. And the regular network on Instagram. Make sure y'all subscribe, man. Appreciate y'all. Peace out.